Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Selling Greenville, your favorite real estate podcast here in lovely Greenville, South Carolina. I'm your host, as always, Stan McCune, realtor right here in the Greenville area. And as always, you can find all of my contact information in the show notes if you need to reach out to me for any of your real estate needs. And just a reminder, as always, if you enjoy the show, please subscribe. Make sure that you don't miss any future episodes. Please go ahead and hit that little five-star rating. Leave a short little review. And I would appreciate all of that. That's all that I ask from you guys, that and that you give me some real estate business at some point. I'd appreciate that as well. It's always a good thing. Um, but uh, but that's it. Please leave a five-star rating and a little review and subscribe, and then we are good to go. Today is a very special day. I've been trying to do this, or I've been trying to build up for this for a long time to finally have a guest on the show. And so I'm I'm very excited to do this. I'm also doing a video of this. Now, we'll have to see. I'm, I'm trying to do multiple things at once that I've never done before. So we'll see if I end up uh, moving forward with the video. But regardless, I have today a very special guest, Derek Horton, who is a Senior Vice President and Mortgage Executive at Southern First. And um, Derek uh, and I got connected very early on in my personal real estate career. He's handled since that time every personal personal mortgage that I've gotten, um, as well as a huge percentage of my clients' loans over the years. And uh, yeah, we've had battles with appraisers, we've had battles with underwriters, uh, battles with unreasonable sellers, the whole gamut. Um, but I can say genuinely that Derek has legitimately gotten deals done for me over the years that I don't think any other uh, mortgage executive loan officer would have been able to do. And I think that that is really the highest praise that a realtor can can ever give to someone in the mortgage space. So uh, Derek, welcome to the show. Thank you uh, for coming on. Thank you for all the work you've done over the years. And uh, yeah, welcome. Man, thank you. Thank you. That's a great introduction. I'll take it. Yeah, uh, you're, right, you're right. If a realtor can endorse you, that's that's as good as it gets. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So um, thank you for having me on. Yeah, you're you're very welcome. I'm, I'm uh, I couldn't think of anyone who I'd rather have as my first guest on on the show, um, nice. just with all of the stories that we could tell. And uh, I don't know if we'll oh, tell yeah. I don't know if we'll tell any of the juicy ones, but uh, but we, we could <laughs> we could do that all day. <laughs> yeah. Maybe maybe you'll come back on the show and we'll have to do that uh, another time. But I, I want to start with this. Um, a lot of people these days, they just want to Google mortgage lenders and, and you know, they, they're just looking up, you know, what's the what's the cheapest rate that they can get um, or or what's a lender that, that they can get that, you know, just has a, a little chat feature that I can just upload things online. I don't have to talk to anyone. Um, that's what a lot of people are are wanting to do these days or or they think that that's what they want to do and i talked on the show in the past about why i think it's important to go with a local lender and a local loan officer but i'd like for you yeah. to just take a moment to give your elevator pitch on from your perspective as a loan officer someone who's been doing this for years what is it from your perspective that is the thing that separates a local lender local loan officer from one of these internet you know I brokerage uh, companies that 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 does lending. Yeah, I think um, the the number one thing I would say, and it just happened recently, um, and I, I won't name the company, but a client came to me after a they were in the middle of a transaction, two weeks away from closing. They had an online lender that they had found, and they ran into a little bit of a hiccup, and the online lender became unresponsive. For like a week so didn't hear from them you know they couldn't get them the realtor couldn't get them no one could get them imagine that so, yeah and so <laughs> they end up calling me we end up jumping in we have to get in the the transaction to closing and i say all that to say the number one reason i think is because generally speaking the local loan officer has tons of relationships that matter to them they care deeply about the particular realtor that they are probably that is involved in the transaction um, and generally speaking, they care uh, about the client that they're going to have to look in the eye at some point because they're local and they run into them or they see them at the closing table. So I think ultimately they care a little bit more. They're not just a person 
uh, behind a, a telephone or a computer that never interacts really with the, with the client. So ultimately, I think that's the, the key, right, is that they have skin in the game themselves. And so that makes all the difference in the world in getting the loan to the finish line. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, I think as well, one thing that I didn't really understand when I broke into this industry that I understand a lot more now is how a local lender, they just they you guys have relationships with with the underwriters, with the appraisers. And there, there's just accountability kind of across the board that you yeah. just don't you know, I've, I've had closings with Rocket Mortgage and Quicken Loans and whatnot over the years they just don't have those relationships. And so when the, you know, what hits the fan, um, yeah. they're not gonna, they're not going to be able to, to step in and, and save the day. We're kind of at the, at the whim of all these other parties. Yeah, I would echo that. So uh, when I was getting into the mortgage business and I was interviewing, I interviewed with a ton of companies cause I was trying to find the best place. And uh, another lender who had been in the business a long time said, wherever you go, make sure you can see the underwriter. Make sure you know the processor. Make sure that you have a relationship with them. And it's true. So if I, if, if I have a problem with a loan, the un, I can literally go talk to the underwriter down the hall. And it is much harder for an underwriter to just, uh, it's much easier for an underwriter in Idaho to check a box, decline a loan, move on, if they don't have to interact with me on a daily basis. The, there's accountability there that you just don't have when they're distant. And so I think the, a local lender has the relationships around them uh, that that really can can make or break the transaction. It's such a dicey. We talked about this, you and I. There's so many things that can go wrong. And so if you have a local lender and a local realtor who have relationships, they can help navigate all those problems versus, you know, someone that you don't know. You tried to list yourself or you tried to buy without an agent. I mean, there's just whatever it is, having the right people around you will make all the difference in the world. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, a lot of people, I, and honestly, I kind of put myself in this uh, category as well. Like, we don't necessarily know what your day to day looks like, like as a loan officer, mortgage executive, walk us through like, what's what's a day for you kind of a standard day look like? Yeah, so um, we work, um, generally speaking, we work uh Flex, flexible schedules like you do, because, you know, if I'm here, I may not, I may not be as busy on a Tuesday. I, I don't, I don't even work. What are you, <laughs> no, I'm just as kidding. I am on a, as, as I am on a Friday because, you know, listings come out on Thursday or whenever, and then all of a sudden all these people want to see this house and they need pre-approval. So our schedules vary, you know, we pretty much work, we're on call all the time. Um, on a day, just a typical day, for example, this morning, um, I, you know, got up, I got to the office at like 8.15. The crazy, it's a little bit busier than normal with applications. So we had about eight pre-approvals we had to get done this morning. Um, I did. And so most of my day this morning was spent pulling credit, um, reviewing the financials clients had uploaded and uh, sending out pre-approvals. Uh, most of them, uh, and not and trying to work through issues that um, the clients had, right? And so that's a big part of the day when you have a lot of applications. So I would say getting applications and then reviewing those is a big part of the day. Once the loan is underwritten, written, another big part of the day is getting all of the, the financial, extra financial documents that the underwriter has requested before the loan can close. Oh, yeah. So that's a big portion of the day. Um, and then following up phone calls, um, being a being a loan officer is a sales position. And so you 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 spend a lot of time in those details of the actual loans you're working on. But then if you don't dedicate a large part of your day to building relationships with financial advisors and realtors and other bankers and, and whoever, you know, then you're not going to have any business you know, the next month. And so, you know, it's a balance constantly of not getting too caught up in the weeds of one particular loan um, and trusting the people in the back office to do their job, which is not easy to do because there's a lot riding on it. And then also balancing, you know, the sales side, which is building relationships out in the market. So 
Um, I would say a good loan officer is working long days, you know, especially in the spring and, and fall. Um, it's not a, you know, it's like real estate, you're on call all the time and there's, there's always problems. And so you're just dealing, that's what you're dealing with. You're kind of a problem solver overall. Um, and so I think that's, um, you know, I always say the best loan officers manage the chaos for the client and the realtor to an extent, right? Those are the best. Yeah, they absolutely. manage all, they take all the anxiety and pressure of the transaction and they ab absorb a, as much of it as possible so that, that the people, other people, their client in particular, don't have to kind of deal with it. Yeah, absolutely. Now, one thing that kind of piqued my interest, you mentioned an uptick in mortgage applications. Is that just a random thing or is that something that, that you're kind of seeing uh, and, and others are seeing right now? I don't really know. Um, honestly, I just saw all the data that said mortgage applications are down. We yeah, so did I. About that. And so, but since last Tuesday, uh, for whatever reason, we I have seen, my, me personally, and I, I haven't really checked with a lot of the other bankers, but I have personally seen an uptick in, in applications. So, um, I don't know if it's just, it's just an ano anomaly, but... Um, we'll have to keep track of that. I don't know. I'll t hey, I'll take it. I'll take yeah, it. Yeah, <laughs> ab absolutely. Um, what? So, one thing I was thinking about is I was kind of thinking through some of the questions I wanted to ask you, and and a lot of these questions are, I'm not trying. I'm not like fishing for anything. I, I'm like yeah, legitimately. Yeah. Yeah. I I, I want to actually hear what you have to say. So, what's something that you know now about real estate or the mortgage industry that you wish you knew earlier in life or earlier in your career? Yeah, that's a good point. So I think um, what's what's uh, something that I wish I knew? I think I wish um, I would have known. Um, for me personally, I wish I would have known um, how how much easier it was to get a home loan than I thought it was going to be. Um, for me personally, in okay. the beginning. So I. I um, you know, did not have did not have a lot of money at 23, 24 years old. Um, I was, you know, kind of throwing money away, you know, with the how how I was living, you know, and um, and eventually I started to get married around 25, and I did not want my wife living in the where I was living, and so sure. I started looking into it and realized like there's options out there, um, and where I didn't have to have a ton of money to put down, you know? And so, um, and so I was able to buy my house using a USDA program, which is no money down, um, when I was 25, which was, you know, 20 years ago. And, and, uh, and so I think what, I would, what part, what part of the, was that in the upstate? Yeah, it was in Duncan In Duncan. Okay. Yep. Yep. And so I was able to, you know, I think, so looking back, I would have, I would have just started, maybe trying to buy a house earlier, you mm. know, because I didn't think it was possible for me. I actually grew up uh, in a single wide trailer. We upgraded to a double wide. Um, <laughs> and I was one of the first people in my family to ever own a house. And so it just wasn't in my realm, really. And had sure. it not been for my wife's family, I don't even know if I would have pursued it. They're like, you've got a good job. You should just go talk to a loan officer, you know? Um, and so I think for people out there, I think that just just take the first step, reach out to a realtor, reach out to me or a loan officer, any loan, you know, any local loan officer and just at least have a conversation. It doesn't hurt to do that. How, how much longer uh, was it after you bought that first house that you got into the mortgage business? So uh, interesting story. So I was 25. I did not get into banking until I was 31. Um, so I was kind of working in a call center and then doing a couple of other, other types of jobs. Um, and then a friend of mine was in banking and I didn't go straight into mortgage, um, right away. I was kind of a personal banker and then branch manager and kind of morphed into just doing mortgage lending. But I became, um, really interested in mortgage lending because, um, uh, a couple of things. Number one, the first time I ever, uh, thought I was going to buy a house, which was right around 25. The loan officer was not local and they fumbled the deal. <laughs> and then I got in touch with a local lender who got me to the closing table. So um, you saw I, the always value remember, firsthand. I always remembered that experience 
And when I decided I was going to get into mortgage, I, you know, it was very meaningful to me because I remembered how much anxiety I had felt through the process. And I wanted to try to figure out a way to help my clients, not it, really through constant communication, not experience the, the, the angst that you feel during the time you're under contract to the time you close. And so, um, and so that, you know, that was part of me being in the mortgage business. And then um, how critical, um, you know, I, I don't remember where I read it, but how critical owning a home is to our society, right? The stability of families, right? Kids not being moved around a bunch of times. My dad had moved around a ton growing up, you know, from one house to another. Um, and, and so um, me, uh, and my parents, luckily, you know, they rented a lot, but they did not move me around a lot, thankfully. But generally, when you rent, you move around a lot. And so how, uh, you know, home ownership gives a lot of stability to families. And it's the primary tool by which most Americans build wealth. Mm -hmm. And so I uh, became uh, early on in banking, realized like I felt like the most important part of the financial world was being in the housing market. And so you know, I made that, I made sure that that was kind of the path I was on. Yeah, that's great. So over the years that you've done this, um, which, how many years is it now? Uh, I feel like we, didn't we both start around the same time? I started in the mortgage full-time in 2017. So yeah, so about in, the same time. I was in banking. banking, I was in banking, you know, or, you know, for 14 years or so, but in okay. the mortgage specifically. And, and, and kind of banking can be weird, right? You can do mortgages in a lot of different ways. Um, there was a bank I was at for years where I would do mortgages, but I was a salaried employee and I was like, a, I'd do mortgages if somebody walked in the branch and where I would refer them to a traditional mortgage person. So mm -hmm. banks are kind of, banks and, you know, there's all kind of ways you can get in the mortgage sure. world. I've been full full time only doing mortgages since 2017. Um, and so, you know, if you came to me for, a, if somebody came to me for a car loan or, uh, you know, any, any other kind of loan, I can't do it. I'm just doing, I just help people buy houses, so. Yeah, so I, I got licensed in 2016, but I started doing this full time. We met right, yeah, we, 2017 met, at the as well. we met at the beginning kind of a, at our both, both kind of early stages of being all in on real estate, so. Yeah, yeah, I think you were the one that reached out to me. Um, I think probably so. That's generally how we. Yeah, that is generally how we're it happens. We're, we're, de we're desperate. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, as far as um, just kind of what you've seen over the years, what what's typically um, what's typically like the most common misconception that you feel like people have when they're trying to get a mortgage? Is it that they don't? Re is it this the misconception that you had that you didn't realize that you could? Um, or, or that you could get a mortgage or is there something else that you run into that's kind of like, okay, this is a, a common pitfall. It, I think it, it falls along those lines. I think the biggest misconception is that you have to have 20% down. You have to have mm. a lot of money. Oh, you, have to have a lot of mo you have to have a lot of money to, 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 to buy a house. Um, and I don't know where that comes from. I do think that it is, it is becoming less and less a misconception because mm -hmm. of all the the internet marketing out there now yeah but i i think that there was generations before us our parents who private mortgage insurance was astronomical if you don't have 20 percent down on a property you've got to pay an extra premium to your mortgage payment and i think it was astronomical and it was not worth it to buy a house in their in their mind has pmi so, come down a lot in, in it's come uh, down a lot so okay. used to like when my when my parents um, we're buying a house um, and they didn't have 20% down, PMI was astronomical because there was only maybe one or two companies that offered it. Well, now there's a bunch. And it's not just that there's a bunch, it's that the technology allows all lenders to quote them all at the same time. So in a simultaneous quote, so you hit a button and every one of them will give you a premium, uh, a price, a monthly price. And you're just going to choose, you're going to choose the lowest one for your client obviously there's no incentive for you to choose a higher one so um and so they're daily battling to get their rates as low as possible they want to be barely the lowest they don't want to be too low because then they're going to lose money but they want to be right there at the threshold so they're they're constantly changing so i think people for a long time thought 20 percent. you have to have 20 percent, or you're going to pay 500 dollars a month on private mortgage insurance which is 
a big misconception. Yeah, um, that, that's interesting. I would say that's a misconception number one, and that flows into it's not possible for me, right? Right. People think it's not home ownership is not possible. I, I've rented my whole life. My parents have rented their whole life, um, and it's just not even in their sphere of of being able to buy. Well, yeah, um, the, with the median price point in Greenville being three hundred thousand, twenty percent of that is sixty. Plus, you've got closing costs. I, I run into people having misconceptions about closing costs. People will be yeah. like, what are closing costs? Is that 15000 Is that 20000 No, it's it's going to be way less than that, typically. I mean, 6500 um, maybe, 7000 Yeah. Know? Yeah. Yep. Um, um, and, yeah, and so that that alone in and of itself, um, you know, I think is a big misconception. So it's, it's it can be much more possible to buy a house than people think. What about on credit? Are, are there any misconceptions that you frequently run into, or is there like one big misconception you frequently run into with people about their credit or about building credit or just about credit scores in general? Yeah, I mean, I would say um, a big misconception is that um, is that number one, my credit is uh, on two, two, two fronts. My credit is too low, right? People think their credit's too low, and sometimes it is, but that doesn't mean you're not going to be able to buy a house. It just means that you got to find a loan officer, not a lo- online because they're not going to help you, but a local loan officer most of the time values the relationship of whoever sent them your way, and they're going to work with you to try to figure out if you've got a 580 credit score, how to get you to a threshold where you can do something, right? What's, so, the, what's the lowest that you can think of that someone came to you the lowest credit that they had that at some point they closed out a loan with you? I think the lowest for me is 600. So um, you can get FHA loans down to 580. Um, We generally try to keep them. We try to get someone to 600 because of the price, the the rate hit that you take Mm -hmm. when you're that even when you get under, under 600. And so if somebody's at 585, we'll say, Hey, let's take 60 days do a few things, try to get your score up. Um, and, what, and what's, what's, what's the lowest though that someone came to you? Oh. They started, what was their starting point? And then Probably you got them up to fives, 515, okay. 520, you know? Um, and uh, how, 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 how long would it take for them to get up to 600 typically? Well, I, I have, I have a client now who's buying a house. Um, she has rented this particular house for 15 years. Okay. Crazy. She's rented this house she's buying wow. for 15 years. She probably came, I can't remember exactly, 560 or so. It took her um, It took her to get it up 100 points. The particular program we wanted to use required a 660 credit score. So it probably took her about a, about a year, okay. may, maybe, a, maybe slightly over, to get her score up. But she got it up. She's going to close in like two weeks, um, maybe even maybe a week. She's, she's, she's ready for closing. Yeah. Um, and she's been renting this house for 15 years, which is cool. She's never owned a house. I don't think anybody in her family has. Um, so I'm super excited about her buying a house. Um, and so if you find a loan officer that's willing to kind of stick with you and you do the things that they tell you to do and be disciplined, you can buy a house. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's extremely re- rewarding to see that, to see, oh. See people, you know, taking steps towards breaking the poverty cycle, you know, that's in some cases has been a generational cycle, um, you know, starting to to kind of finally have the family has their own dirt, you know, and their own house. And, and that's an exciting thing. Man, it's so, so exciting. Uh, another misconception that's, that I think is a big one that I run into a lot is I pay $1,500 a month for my rent. Why can I only get pre-approved for an eleven hundred dollar payment? Mm. And so I have to do a lot of talking to clients and say, listen, when you go to an apartment complex, they're going to check your credit. They might ask for a pay stub, but they're not doing any kind of like calculation as to what you can afford. Right. They're just checking your credit. You know, you got decent credit. You'll probably pay us. They're going to take a security deposit and they're done. When you buy a house, you know, an underwriter is going to look at your credit. They're going to look at all those payments. If you have a $400 car payment and you have a $200 student loan payment and a $100 credit card payment, and then you're going to buy a house and your mortgage payment's $1,100, they're going to take that $1,100 and they're going to add up all those other debts. And they're going to go, oh man, they that's going to be more than 50% of their income if we give them this loan. 
they can't pay a fifteen dollars payment. They can only pay a eight hundred dollars payment or whatever. So I think helping people understand like, hey, just because you're paying that much in rent doesn't mean necessarily you're going to be able to buy a house sure. comfort, comfortably. You know, there's a lot more expenses that come with buy, owning a home. Right. Mm -hmm. um, there's maintenance, there's taxes, insurance, other things. So I think helping people understand and I do that constantly. I send them like a big breakdown of all the numbers. And when they see it on paper, they go, oh, yeah, yeah, I see that now. That makes that makes sense. You know, yeah. And, and it, it makes sense, too, that. You know, if you if you're a landlord or a landlady renting out a property, it's it's only going to tie up a property for a couple of months, at least in South Carolina. If you have to to you know call someone that isn't paying you and ultimately evict them, whereas yeah. if someone forecloses, that's a lengthy process. So it makes sense that it's a it's it's more stringent. Yeah, it's more stringent, and I think just helping people understand that, um, you know, and and there's a lot of times it's, it's the opposite. You know, I tell people, hey, you can qualify up to this amount and they're like what you would give me a loan for that amount i'm like yeah i'm not telling you to go buy that house i'm just <laughs> telling you what you can qualify for and what you can afford are sometimes two different things you know yeah yep yeah oh i've i've run into so many times where people come to me and they're just like derek pre-qualified me for five hundred fifty thousand dollars for my first house like how's that uh, and i'm like well that doesn't mean that you have to buy that it just no, means I, that I, I, try to tell people, I try to tell people that all the time listen don't you know, you may you may have a lot of room, but you don't want your house to be a burden, right? You want it to be an asset that helps you grow wealth over time and provides, you know, financial stability. So you don't want it to be a burden. So don't I tell people this is what you can buy, but I'm not saying you should buy that. So yeah, absolutely. Similar yeah. similar thing to what, what realtors have to say a lot. Yeah. Speaking of Realtors, I, I am curious to hear kind of shifting gears here a little bit. You guys on, on your side, you see us as realtors from and, and from a little bit of a different perspective than maybe the public do. You see kind of a little bit behind the veil. We see a little bit behind the veil of, of what you guys are doing as well. Probably a lot behind the veil. Um, I'm sure there's a lot more that we don't see. Um, but I'm curious from from your perspective as a person you know, having worked in banking and the mortgage industry for as long as you have, what would you say separates an average realtor from a really good one or a great one? Yeah. So, I mean, you know, obviously I do have a lot of uh, thoughts about that and, <laughs> and people do come to mind. <laughs> uh, so yeah, no doubt. I would say uh, what, what surprises me a lot of times um, is the lack of just basic knowledge sometimes amongst sometimes some of some real realtors when I call about an issue or a problem, you know, and I'm like, you know, how how are you able to advise? You know, I see myself as kind of an advisor. I think a realtor is somewhat of an advisor. They are sales positions, but they're more of a, they are an advisory role. You're giving yep. advice a lot of times. And so I'm always surprised by um, some of the things that people people don't know. Uh, some of the things that realtors don't know. I'm ultimately not as bothered by that as I'm bothered by poor communication. Um, and so I think the biggest difference between you and some of your peers is your ability to communicate and keep, uh, just answer your text, answer your phone, answer an email. It's not rocket science. It's just staying in touch with the lender, your clients, the attorney, whoever else. Um, but I think the biggest frustration for me is the the lack of of consistent communication through a, a loan, you know, or through a purchase. So um, I get very frustrated by that when I don't get res responses. I am very frustrated. Is, is this is this where the uh, the the swear words that you warned me about that I might have to edit out uh, <laughs> might come into play? I, mean, I could drop swear words in here. Um, <laughs> What really frustrated me recently, and I posted about this, um, I said on Twitter, good morning to everyone except the realtor who told me to call their transaction coordinator. Uh, and, and, and so I cannot, you know, I'm called, I don't, I generally tend to think of when I'm working on a transaction, you've got a buyer's agent, a seller's agent, and my client. And those are the people I interact with the most. Most of the time, the buyer's agent and my client, occasionally the seller's agent. So when I call 
when I think of who do I need to call about this problem, the first person I think of is the buyer's agent. And then the buyer's agent tells me, no, I'm, not, I'm no longer involved. Call this person. It just blows my mind that, you know, they have just pulled themselves out of the transaction. Um, I just don't understand it because I think um, one of the things that separates our model here at Southern First from other models is we don't hand our clients off. And we get more clients to the closing table than most lenders because we stay involved. We don't pass them off to people. So I think the the realtors, the realtors that I work with that are most successful and that are really good at their job, I'm not saying they don't have help, but they don't pass responsibility off for their clients and that transaction to anyone else. They stay accountable through the whole process. Yeah. Um, and uh, oh man, we could talk about this for forever because obviously, you know, if, if I'm a buyer's agent. Um, or a listing agent, and I'm, you know, dealing on the other side with a, with another agent that is essentially they only see themselves as a salesperson, and then once we're under contract, that they just pass everything off to their assistant or their transaction coordinator who's not licensed. Um, in many cases, even if they are licensed, they they don't have all those relationships. They don't. They're they're kind of jumping in. Uh, it's incredibly frustrating. A lot of times the the transaction coordinators don't answer phones after hours. Have you run into that as often yeah, as I have? Thousands, yeah, thousands. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, uh, or I what, don't have what, a cell. I just have some other number that I text and it says it's a landline, and I'm like, yeah, got to talk to somebody. <laughs> Unbelievable. And 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 probably the worst part about this is that we, you know, just as far as what me and you like we all know this that that these are issues but nobody can actually say anything about the companies or the teams or whatever that are known for doing this there are some that have a reputation for this but yeah. uh, unfortunately it's very difficult for the for the public to find that out they have to kind of find it out the hard way because we can't talk badly about any of any of those groups yeah. so yeah. and i would just say the you know the top the top realtors in the market, they don't really, they don't follow that model. I mean, you know, I know them and they, they stay very active with their clients mm -hmm. through the whole process. Um, and they answer their phones and they answer their emails and they're busy, you know, you know? So I, I just think, um, you know, I think being educated, which is the same as a lender, being educated, knowing your products, knowing how you can help people, they're, they're, and being able to communicate well as a realtor, I think, and 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 valuing communication um, really separates uh, people. And I think when I say communicate, Katie, I mean it, if you're not communicating, I don't think you care very much. And so um, I think the good realtors ultimately, what separates them is that they really, really care, um, and they really they really want that client. Uh, to get that get that particular house and not anything to, you know, destroy the transaction um, because they're not doing their job well. So yeah, absolutely. Same thing for loan officers as well. Um, it's the same. Yeah, it's so it's so you know it is different, but it it mirrors they mirror so closely what what success could look like and what what separates the good from you know the bad. There's a lot more of you guys. <laughs> which makes it probably harder for you to do your job. Sure. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I still think there's a lot of similarities. Yeah. I, I think the most, one of the, one of the most important things for me that I've done from day one, and this was kind of instilled in me from previous job experience was I don't ever think about my paycheck until yeah. I, until I get my paycheck. That's when I think about it. Yeah. Um, because if you, if you're focused on your paycheck, um, you're you're not going to have the client's best interest in mind at the end of the day. Yeah. Um, and uh, unfortunately, there's there uh, talk, talking to other real estate professionals. There's a lot of paycheck focus um, that is uh, that is unfortunate. I mean, but, let's let's just get this done. Don't worry about what's best. Let's just figure out this situation, and it might not benefit either party, or it might benefit one or the other, but let's just get it done. <laughs> yeah, yeah, ex exactly. You know, like, you know, uh, I listed this house. I mean, um, 
I, I know uh, I, I know he could probably get more for it than what we've listed it for, but um, oh well, this is you know he he did it this way. This is gonna be a quick closing for me, you know, kind of thing. And it's just like you didn't you didn't say that the person was leaving money on the table. It's just kind of astonishing to me. Uh, but those conversations happen, and uh, and it's unfortunate. Yeah. Um, th- so obviously, right now, shifting gears again here for for just a moment, um, and this will kind of be the the last little section here because I know you're busy and and I'm busy, and w- we could talk for forever. Oh, yeah. um, <laughs> obviously, what everyone wants to to hear and what they're going to be most interested in hearing from you is about what's happening in the mortgage industry as a whole. We've gone from rates at an all-time low when they were in, you know, the 30 year mortgage. What what was the what was the lowest rate you did for a 30 year mortgage uh the past couple of years? Lowest 30 year was 2.375. 2.375. Oh my no gosh. No points. No points. No, no points. Unbelievable. Uh, the lowest 15 no, I did a 10 year at 175. That's I insane. Did a 10 year, and I did a 15 year at probably two, two percent or so, um, I guess. But yeah, yeah, one seven five or or so to to two three seven five. Which what is, what when was that two three seven five? What do you remember? Kind of month year or roughly? Um, gosh, I would I want to say maybe early early 2020 maybe. Oh. Um, er- yeah, All right, you would, it would have been early 21, right? Because early 2020 would have been pre-pandemic. Yeah, yeah, early 2021 probably. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's right. So, yeah, so um, yeah, because early 2020 was we haven't we haven't we have we heard it was coming, but we're like, ah, oh, we're good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So either late 2020 or early 2021, um, it 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 was just you know I I, I remember. I remember looking at the rate. I remember logging out of my system. The reason I remember the rate so well is I remember logging out of my system because I thought something was wrong. I logged out because there's been times that, you know, something doesn't update right and you get an error. And I was like, there's no way it's 30 years, 237 miles. Um, and I remember logging out, logging back in. And I called another lender who works in the office beside me. I was like, come, come look at this. And we looked. And I'm like, I locked this person in at 2375. And I remember locking it in, sending the, I didn't even, normally you call the client, you tell them, hey, here's what we can offer you. I just locked it in. I was like, this, whoever, you know, I'm going to, they're going to, they're going to do this. <laughs> because yeah, that, that's two, three, seven, five. So I locked it in before I even told the client. Um, and I just, it's just insane how low they were. And, uh, and it, it was, I don't even know how I survived mentally and physically during that time period um, because <laughs> of the hours we were working um but you and me you know, both it did switch very fast when it switched <laughs> it did so yeah so now now what are we hovering around like seven percent we're we're kind of in that range uh, just on an average level yeah i would say um six eight seven five to seven one two five right now um on the 30-year fixed the crazy thing is four weeks ago. We're, and for, for, for the audience, we're recording this on March the 8th, 2023, just just yeah. for receipt keeping. Yeah. And so and so a month ago, um, those rates were back in the low, low our high fives again, you know. Um, and so people were back on the Internet saying we hit the peak. We're headed. We're, we're, we're back down. Um, and then the jobs report came out and then the inflation report was not as slow as uh they had liked it i think and uh we were back at at seven percent very very quickly and uh it's been rocky because you you pre-approve people at six percent and now they're at six eight seven five yeah and that lowers their ability their purchasing power um the market is still very if you're you know wherever you're listening greenville is still a hot market and so you know house prices are higher and rates do not allow that buying power that people need so. Are, are, are there any rumblings that like assumable mortgages will start to become, you know, s- kind of come back in vogue here in, in the next few years? Is that something that anyone's talking about yet? Yeah, I mean, I hear I hear a lot. You know, there's a lot of lenders that talk about assumable mortgages online. Um, it's less it's less it's, it's very it's less likely because basically what happens is there's only a few types of loans that are usually assumable. Right. FHA, some VA. Um, 
and, and maybe some some bank portfolio loans depending on the situation um most but most of the time if that client has bought a house and it's been a couple of years their house price has appreciated so much compared to their loan and also they may have paid down their loan a little bit and so there's a lot of times people don't have the money to make up the gap to get that loan uh to just assume if the house is worth 300 and that person has a two hundred twenty thousand dollar mortgage they don't have the money to get you know that they the, need. the buyer would have to to in that instance would have to bring eighty thousand dollars down and then they would be able to assume to purchase two, it at 300 two, two, and assume yeah. 220. Yeah, yeah. That, and they'll be able to get the 2375 rate or whatever it happens to be. Um, so I, I don't think, in theory, it's great, but I don't think it'll happen a whole lot. Sure, sure. Yeah. Um, so obviously, a lot just in real estate as a whole has changed pretty dramatically since the, the pandemic, obviously, since uh, we're now going on close to three years, I guess, here. We're, we're approaching that that uh, anniversary of uh, when lockdown started. And um, I'm just kind of curious, what's the difference, the biggest difference in your opinion uh, in the mortgage industry the past three years, and, and more so, you know, recently versus what it was uh, pre-pandemic? Yeah, so during, during you know, late um, uh, 2021, um, you know, mortgage rates were, I think December 18th, I think I locked in a rate at 3375, you know, I think by May, um, May or June of 2022. So six months later, the rates were at like five and a half or five, two, five. So, I mean, I mean, that's, massively slowed oh, yeah. the mortgage market. I mean, um, and and so what loan officers went from being extremely busy to honestly, um, a lot of peers have moved, they're already, they've started moving to other jobs um, because um, there's just not enough, you know, not enough buyers um, that the, the business that was there has is gone because there's no yeah. refinances and a lot of lenders specialize in refinances. Well, when somebody's got a three percent rate, they're not going to refinance, mm -hmm. and likely they're not going to want to move either for a while. So you nope. know, it's just it's just changed the dynamic and it changed it so fast. It's like uh, it was just like a uh, whiplash. You know, um, you went from a full you know full days being extremely busy to trying to figure out what you were going to do, you know, and there's a, I, I made this joke one time about, um, on, online, I, I had this little voiceover thing and it was about, um, it was like a, it was like, uh, builders calling lenders again <laughs> because builders slowed, you know, they needed, they had all these inventory and they needed buyers. Well, yeah, so they've been of, offering us commissions again. <laughs> all of a sudden we love realtors. Yeah you know <laughs> so so that's how drastically it's changed and and even lenders i'm sure you get bothered you know i'm sure it ramped up on your end where you start getting now all these lenders come out of the woodwork wanting to maybe get business trying to get oh yeah yeah i get texts every week yeah yeah so i think it's just drastically changed things um i am very uh I did not think we were in the when, when it hit five eight seven five. I did. I post a lot of videos online. I did not talk. I, I refrained from talking. Hey, rates are low. They're down. They're down because I felt like we were in a nice sweet spot, but it was not going to be the. You know, it was like it's it's like the you get you're like oh it's warming up it's spring and then all of a sudden it's twenty degrees again. So I felt like we were going to hit that and we kind of did. No, I didn't think they would be back at seven percent. I thought maybe six. Yeah, I don't think half. I don't think anyone thought that. Not right now. No, six, seven, five. But I, I've been shocked by that. Um, mortgage applications are up for me, but I, I think that might be because people got word that rates had come down a little bit, and some of them have didn't realize rates were back where they are mm -hmm. until they did the pre-approval. So I'm interested to see how this plays out over the next few months. And seeing what the Fed does March 21st, or I think that's when they meet again. Um, 
you know, I think the, the mortgage market has priced in their next rate hike already, um, anticipating a, maybe a 50, 25 at least, maybe 50 basis point hike. So hopefully we okay, won't can, see- Can you explain that for our clients? Uh, just kind of for a lot of uh, the people that are listening, a lot of, I think I said clients, I meant listeners. A lot of the people listening or, or potentially watching, if I post this on YouTube or, or whatever, um, they're, they're going to already kind of know what causes interest rates and mortgage rates to fluctuate. But uh, and, and I've talked about it a little bit on the show, but do you want to kind of explain mm -hmm. from from your perspective what you, what you see happening, how those rates go up and up and down? Yeah. So, I mean, generally speaking, um, mortgage rates are, are not supposed to follow what the, the, the Federal Reserve is doing with short term rates. OK, they're just they're just not supposed to. So when the Fed's raising prime, mortgage rates are supposed to be kind of, you know, separate from that. Um, but I think the Fed, what's happened is the Fed has has raised them short term rates so fast, you know, with the, which is the Wall Street Journal prime um, from what was it at zero? I mean, it was like it was zero at one point, I think, uh, in the low, lowest part to what it is now. Um, the, the Wall Street Journal Prime, I think, is 7.75. And so, I mean, I think that the mortgage market is so uncertain as to what it's going to do to the economy that they are pricing in the risk in mortgage rates. They don't know. So if you're a bank, for example, let's just say you're, you're a person and you own a bank and you see the Fed take rates and just put them, attach a, attach a rocket to them and shoot it into space. At some point, it's going to cause drastic, not maybe drastic, but significant unemployment. When people get unemployed, they stop paying their bills. Now, the mortgage is generally the last thing that they stop paying, but if it lasts long enough, they stop paying their mortgage. So if you are anticipating people not being able to pay their bills, you, you, you need to get you, a little bit more upfront, maybe you're exactly you're expecting it's high risk. And so the only way you can make money in a high risk situation is to have higher interest rates. And so our mortgage rates should not be as high as they are when you look at the 10 year treasury, which is what mortgage rates are supposed to follow. They should be in the high 5% range. But banks and brokers and lenders across the country are like, they can't keep raising rates and it not cause massive economic slowdown, which sure. in turn causes people not to pay their bills. And, and so that's, that's what's going on. They're just, it's just risk being priced into the market. So, so what, uh, what's your prediction? And the listeners like bold predictions. So don't, uh, don't be scared to be wrong. I've, I've been, I've made some bold predictions. I've been wrong on a few of them, but what would be uh, if you had to make a, a, a prediction for what's going to happen with rates, whether uh, whether we're at the ceiling or whether it's going to it's going to continue to go up or whether we're going to see them go down at, at, by a certain time period? What, what are what are you kind of thinking is going to happen here? Bold predictions. I, I will. Let me just preface this, that I am. I am uh, very good at underwriting guidelines i'm terrible at predicting them so <laughs> okay i am i am uh, as dumb as they come when it comes to trying to figure out what my portfolio stock portfolio is going to do and what mortgage rates are going to do Fair. Um, but i would say most of what i read um i i do think that they will soften uh later in the year uh you know i do and, think and later in 2023 Later in 2023, I think we'll see some softening. I think we'll see more softening in, in 2024. Um, I think that, you know, you, you've probably read this too, that a lot of what's driving inflation is, is, is housing, <laughs> yeah. is, you know, the house prices and the, and the real estate market. And so the Fed knows that by continually to pump rates up, they can impact that drastically, right? Yeah. They're pricing borrowers out of the market, especially first time home buyers, and they're pricing a lot of people out, which means they can let inventory catch up a little. I don't know if it'll catch up fully, but catch up a little, which will slow kind of the, the inflation number. So I, I think we may see a little bit higher rates from where we are now. Um, I don't 
I have never thought they would hit 8%, and I still don't think they will, but I, th- I still think we could see maybe mid to high sevens. Um, okay. You know, and like then, the summer is that is that kind of when you would anticipate that happening? Late spring, maybe, maybe okay. late spring. Um, so, and then and then maybe maybe some pullback beginning slowly from there. Um, and I think we, I don't know if we'll ever. I mean, maybe I, it, ever is a hard word, but I think if we can get rates into the five percent range, five to six percent, um, we could have a healthy housing market there and stay there for a while. Um, I don't think we have to have 3% rates again. I think that's that was very unhealthy. Um, it was very good for a lot of people, but ultimately- it's good I, for you guys. <laughs> yeah, ultimately, I think if you think about someone driving a car, COVID happened and the Fed pulled the car to one side, all the way to one side, and rates were low, and now they're trying to correct. And, and some people say, well, they're overcorrecting. I don't know if they are, but ultimately, if they can just get the- the, the housing market and the mortgage market get interest rates back to us just a, a, a fair ground, which I think is in the 5% range where a lot of people can still afford houses, um, but money is not 2% cheap. <laughs> right. Um, I think it'll be good. So sure. What, what do you, um, what do you think it'll take for rates to come down? Like what, what, what needs to happen for those rates to start to fall. By, by the way, I, I want to mention as well, I think you're right. The I went to a conference recently that said 5.25 is the magic number. Above that, dramatic slowdown. Below that, uh, buyer activity starts to pick up a, a bit. So, yeah but, uh, yeah. but 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 what would it take for it to, to start to come down into that range? I think, um, again, you know, I failed economics, not in fail, but I did not do well in college. Economics was a lot harder than I thought it would be when I was in school. Um, I, I do think that if we get unemployment, um, if unemployment increases a little bit, I mean, it, incre- it increased a little bit, but it's still, what, four, is it 4.5%? I mean, it's somewhere around there. It's, it's still historically extreme. Yeah, it's very low. It's like extremely low. So if unemployment increases a little bit, and they see a little bit more pullback on the inflation numbers. I don't think there, there's an unemployment report, I think, this week. So it's interesting to see what that is. But I think once the Fed sees, like, part of me thinks maybe the Fed has not waited for some of this stuff. They have not waited for their work that they've done to catch up, right? So at some point, because they just keep going, oh, yeah, unemployment, nope, let's do it again. Let's raise again. So I'm hoping that's not the case, and I'm hoping that each time they're doing it, it's, it is impacting a little bit, and not all of a sudden we're going to have a drastic recession um, that's that's really brutal for a lot of people. I tend to think, hopefully, as the Fed sees unemployment rise a little bit and you know inflation come down a little bit, that they will have a couple of meetings where they don't do anything. They don't raise rates. They don't lower their short-term rates. And I think if they do that, it signals to the to the economy and to the markets that, all right, we think maybe inflation kind of peaked. And, and, and so now we're going to just in a holding pattern. I think if we get in a holding pattern, I think you'll start to see mortgage rates soften a good bit. Sure. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not super optimistic about the Fed uh, not doing anything. But uh, but I think this I think in March they're going to rate. I think. The last I saw, there's a 22% probability they would raise them 50 basis points. I prefer. And and how would, and if that happened, how would that impact the mortgage market? I think the mortgage market has built most of that anticipation already in, which is why we've seen okay. a steep climb since last time. So I don't think we'll see a big upswing March leading up to March 20th or 21st. If the if after March, if they raise them a lot and then it looks like it's not working then i think we could see another climb sure which could get us to the high sevens but i'm hopeful that you know this next meeting um you know we won't see what they're doing is at some point what they're doing has got to to work and so um you know we'll see it's it's hard to know you know and it's hard to run a bank um you know i'm you know, we're we're not a huge bank, but we're not a small bank either, but we're very close to the leadership. And so 
it's very difficult for a bank to um to manage these waters because yeah, it's crazy. they don't know they don't know month to month what the fed's doing is it, is it is it crazier now than it was like right after the pandemic when things were so chaotic or was that a more chaotic period of time? No, I think it's way more stressful now for banks okay, trying to trying to figure it out. I think they're, you know, I think, um, you know, the cost of money, um, you know, banks need need, you know, banks have to have deposits to lend. And so every time the Fed raises rates, that's why you see banks paying like ours paying high money market rates. Well, if you're paying four, seven, five on a money market, you can't lend at five, two, five. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> because you're not going to make any money. So I think it's just very stressful trying to manage, trying to know what the Fed's going to do. And and um, and so I think, you know, it's, inter it's interesting times in the finance world for sure. So. For sure. Well, we'll close with this one. Uh, one last question I have. What are you telling people who would like to buy a home right now, but but do have concerns about those mortgage rates being so high? Yeah, so that's that's a good um, that's that's really a good question. I um, I'm not the kind of mortgage person that thinks it's right at every moment for someone to buy a house. Right? There's people that um, have all kind of situations going on in their life. Um, my my wife's dealt with health problems over the years, and there were times that we rented just because it was simply easier. You know, it was, we didn't have a lot of other stress. We could be near doctors, you know, rent near near doctors. And so um, I don't think everybody should buy. But I say this, if you are going to be a homeowner and you desire to be a homeowner, the house, the houses in the upstate of South Carolina are not going to be any cheaper um, to me, in my opinion, than they are right now. Um, we have a massive inventory shortage. We have massive amounts of people moving into our market because it's a great place to live. And so I, I heard, would, I, heard uh, I heard yesterday we have 20 people per day yeah, moving, yeah. moving into our market. Yeah, and it was 19 a few months ago. So I've seen that stat. It's, it's getting a little higher. So I, I think if you're looking to buy a house, I think you should start the conversation now with a lender and realtor um, because um, you can you can always you're going to when rates come down, you're going to be able to get a lower rate. Um, and so that's just you do that through a refinance. And so I think if you can buy a three hundred and fifty thousand dollar house right now, um, that three hundred fifty thousand dollar house is going to cost you a lot more two years from now um, in the upstate. And that's just my opinion. Um, but I don't think we're going to see massive pullback. Um, bankruptcies are. Uh, extremely low across the whole industry. They're even lower in the upstate um, because of employment. So foreclosures are, are, despite some of the misleading headlines saying that foreclosures are up oh. by 100% and all this kind of nonsense, they're still extremely low. Yeah. So I say bankruptcies because generally that, that overarches too, right? It brings into the foreclosure focus. Foreclosures are, I mean, they're nothing compared to what they were. So people that say a housing crash is coming, it's not it's not going to happen. And I think my opinion is there's a few reasons. Right. Americans have way more equity than they've ever had in their houses. Americans have ex extremely low interest rates on their mortgage. overall. Yeah. their payments are very, very reasonable that even if they do lose their job, um, they may be able way more likely to weather that storm and make that payment than they did in 2009 or 10. So. I just, I just, and, think if, and if not, they've got enough equity they can just sell. They've got equity to sell, and and it'll it'll buy them time to find a house, pay off other debts, and so I think I think people waiting for the market to crash, especially in I'm sure in certain markets there's been pullback, and and that may be smart to wait a little while. But if you're in the upstate of South Carolina, if you're in Charleston, if anywhere really in South Carolina, in in, in you know a lot of places, it Charlotte, North Carolina, Atlanta, it's just the demand is so big. I don't think you're going to you're going to see a benefit from waiting. It's yep. only going to cost you in the long run. So. Yeah. Yeah. And and that's what I've been telling my listeners as well. So that I, I appreciate you reinforcing uh, <laughs> what I've been already uh, saying on the show for for months and, and really years at this point. Yeah. And let but, me uh, let me just say to your uh, listeners, too, that you, um, you know, if they um, are thinking about buying a house or, or you know, or, you know, have never 
have never decided, you know, or thinking about it, um, how um, definitely they should give you a call because you are one of the best in the market. You care you. deeply about your clients. Um, I've seen how well you communicate. I've seen your knowledge, uh, which if they listen to you, they probably are aware that you're very knowledgeable about all things real estate. So um, I don't think uh, they could find a better advocate for them uh, than you. And so, um, you know, if they're listening, they should definitely, um, I, I, I always think, I don't think a lender, sh I think a realtor is the best first call. I just, that's just my, my, my viewpoint. I think they can have a lot of, you guys know enough about a lot of things to have a, a, a general conversation. And then you can refer that client to the person, the lender that you think best fits them. And so I think, um, you know, just telling your listeners how great you are at your job. Cause I've seen it firsthand and I've seen us navigate really wild situations and really difficult situations that we've been able oh, to yeah. figure out. So, um, and so that takes, uh, that takes special people. And, and you're certainly one of those that are really good at your job. Well, I appreciate that. I did not pay uh, Derek to say any of that just for the record. Um, did not. And, and, and we as realtors, we can't get kickbacks from, from these lenders either. Um, that would be illegal. So, um, and I intentionally said to Derek, not, not to, that he doesn't need to feel pressured to pump me up. So I do appreciate <laughs> that you did that in, uh, in spite of all of that, but, uh, yeah. Derek, I appreciate it. It's been, well, going back from before we were recording this, it's been over an hour and, uh, and your time is valuable. So I, I really appreciate you giving that time to me, to the show, to the listeners. Um, can I give can, a, one shout out? Yeah, go for it. Okay, one shout out because it's International Women's Day. All right. So we're going to give a shout out to all the ladies out there, all the women. I read this quote earlier this morning. Whatever women do, they must do twice as well as men to be thought half as good. Luckily, that's not very difficult. <laughs> <laughs> shout great. out to all the wonderful women out there. We, yep. When this records, it'll be past. Uh, it'll be past that day, but but we will celebrate it. Uh, w sorry, not when it records, when it uh, when it airs. But we we will retroactively sell, uh, <laughs> retroactively enjoy and celebrate uh, International Women's Day. So I appreciate that, Derek. That was Derek Horton with Southern First Bank. If you need to uh, get his contact information, you can reach out to me. My contact information is in the show notes. As always, as always, please. If you like this show, please subscribe, please leave a rating, leave a review. Derek, again, thank you. I appreciate it. And uh, to all the listeners, we will talk again next time.